Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to The Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to Chanel Mullen. Chanel is the experimentation and analysis lead at Shopify. She's also my friend and former coworker from my days working at CXL. We spent years in the trenches, writing and editing each other's work, learning conversion optimization and experimentation and data analysis and sharing those learnings with the world, or at least the small fraction of the world that cares about Bayesian versus frequentist statistics anyway. So obviously this conversation was super fun, and we talked about the worlds of content and writing as well as the worlds of experimentation and CRO, which is really a a unique opportunity to do so since she and I are probably among the few that work across both of those areas. We talked about impatience as a virtue, what we miss about working at CXL, hint, high standards, and the ability to explore our curiosities and get paid for it, Uh, leadership lessons and how to carve out um, companies and cultures that allow this sort of curiosity exploration and experimentation, and how poetry and songwriting factor into work-life balance and fuel creativity. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Chanel Mullen. Um, what do you miss about working at CXL? Uh, that's a good question. I feel like I miss the influence of Pep, mm-hmm. <laughs> probably. Like, I feel like he had a very high standard for everything. And I, I think going into that role, I thought that I also internally had a high standard for myself. <laughs> and now I feel like it's been switched out internally for like a little mini Pep who asks me is, <laughs> would you publish this? <laughs> Do you still have that? Tommy Walker says that he's got like a little editorial voice in his head that resembles Pep's editorial voice. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But it applies to everything, I think. is like anytime I'm about to like hit send on something, I'm like, "Hmm, would I would I have sent this to Pep? I don't know if he intended to forever be in my brain this way, but he he appears to be. (laughs) It's an interesting like... um anecdote on leadership because i think it's something that not a lot of people think about but for me at least like that's what i miss as well was the high standards and high expectations but i feel like a lot of management practices today are are kind of centered around i don't want to say the opposite but it's more so like a a nourishing a softness a you know complimentary like very very complimentary nature as opposed to um, really holding somebody up to the bar that uh, they want to be held up to um so it's kind of interesting like i I wonder sometimes if I'm losing that, um, that like high standard for myself and like how I kind of maintain that in my head. Have you felt any, any sort of like creeping, um, I don't know, loss of, of that high standard that you had at CXL? Um, I don't think so. Like, I think that, I think that a big part of my career has been a big part of my success in my career has been getting to largely choose the people that I work for. Um, And I very deliberately look for people who have those high standards, but then also to your point, like kind of that softness. Like I think uh, I prefer working with people who lead with kindness, but also have high standards. I think that a lot of the times people think it's uh, in opposition to one another, but I think that you can be a very, you know, kind, caring person who advocates for the people who work for them. um, And then also, you know, hold their craft quality to a high standard. Yeah, totally. Are you um, at Shopify right now? What are you working on? Are you leading a team or what's your what's your day in the life right now? Yeah, so I'm an experimentation and analysis lead. And so I lead the experimentation pod. It's a strategy and ops team. So we're doing like strategy, foundation, operations, analysis, uh, kind of, yeah, the, the foundational thinking around experimentation and how the growth teams can use that as a vehicle for for CRO and, and any form of optimization. Does that mean that you guys own the tech stack as well? Like, are you, are you in charge of the, I don't know if you use Google analytics or Optimizely or kind of what, whatever like MarTech stack you guys have, is that like in your purview as well? Kind of the tooling? We set it a super interesting intersection of like data science, engineering and marketing. And we kind of coordinate with all three of those areas, which is interesting context switching. Um, so I don't know that I would say we, own the tech stack but i would say that we work closely with the engineering team and the data science team to improve and consult on 
on how we use technology to, to experiment. Yeah. Your team sounds, I mean, I've talked to Morgan Brown uh, about like the team yeah. structure at Shopify and like, I don't think there's any sort of perfect org structure, but it sounds like you guys have set up your at least growth and experimentation programs in a really ideal way. Like it's, it's kind of, your team is kind of like the center of excellence, correct? Like you, you're going to help and enable other teams in their experimentation, not necessarily just centralize all of the CRO and all of the efforts through you guys. Yeah, exactly. When we first started, it was more centralized um, and it was, it was our team kind of coming up with the experiments and designing them and launching them and then analyzing them. And we were borrowing dev resourcing and we were borrowing design resourcing from wherever we could get it. Um, and then, you know, especially with Morgan Brown's influence and, and different leaders influence, experimentation has a ton of buy-in at Shopify and is becoming more and more useful and used. Um, and so we had to rapidly decentralize the way that we did experimentation. And uh, we kind of worked ourselves out of the role of being the person who does every element of the of the process uh, of an experiment to kind of being the center of excellence model. Um, and it's been really interesting because I've never, I've never worked at a company at this stage of experimentation maturity in this role before. I've never had to bridge the gap between a small experimentation program and a large experimentation program. And it's been very interesting problems to consider. So how, how does that look? How does that exhibit itself? Like, would you, um, are you kind of focused on like the processes, guardrails, you know, QA checklists, like basically the, the best practices by which somebody experiments and then you just sort of like educate and hand those off to those teams? Or would it say like, like an email team or like a product team comes to you and they're like, hey, we want to like learn how to basically wrap experimentation up into our, um, you know, our sprint process? Like, and would, would you guys actually handhold and like run the first couple experiments and teach them? Or I guess concretely, what does this look like when you're working with other teams and how do you actually support and enable them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of earlier this year, when we were starting to decentralize, um, it was a lot more of just straight up education. We, mm -hmm. you know, built a live workshop and we air quotes tricked everyone into coming to said workshops so that we could quickly get everyone on growth up to speed on the basics of experimentation. Um, and now I would say it's more moving into an embedding model where we'll work really closely with some of the growth teams and we are more hands-on with them and we kind of show them the process. We talk to them about the strategy behind the process. We talk to them about, you know, the science and the math behind the processes um, so that they can eventually go off on their own. Um, so it's kind of, it's an interesting balance of strictly supporting growth marketing teams. And then also we have a lot of foundational things that we work on separate of the growth teams. My cat is here. Um, <laughs> separate of the growth teams. So it's an interesting balance between those two objectives and figuring out, you know, is it 50% with the growth teams embedding or is it 75% and how do we leave time for the problems that affect everyone or will eventually affect everyone that we can foresee? Gotcha. So I have a question on the education side. So my day job, apart from uh, this agency that I'm running, is basically <laughs> managing the experimentation program and team and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I have found that. Um, I, I like through the years that I spent working at CXL, um, I feel like I built up such a large backlog of like theoretical knowledge. Like I've got kind of an esoteric library in my brain of like, oh, this is when you would run, run a non inferior non inferiority test or like sequential testing or like like there's just so much kind of esoteria in my brain. And then coming in like and because one of my main jobs is educating essentially on on kind of the data side and experimentation side. And it's been kind of difficult um, transmitting the, <laughs> that knowledge without like like overwhelming people. So I guess like my question is, did you face something similar? Spending you know years and years working with Pep, who has these high standards, and basically like CXL set the standard for the industry in many ways. You know, evangelized how to do experimentation and CRO on the marketing side. Um, was it hard for you to come in and, and act as an educator, or do you think that it actually improved your ability to do so? Because I feel like a lot of people come in and they maybe know what an A-B test is loosely, but 
just the level to which we were researching was was pretty in the weeds. Right. Yeah. I I don't know. I think it's interesting because I did didn't do formal education in any capacity and I kind of learned what I needed to learn specific for the jobs that I was trying to do. Um, I always felt, I think I've said this to you multiple times, that I, I think you tackled a lot of the scientific mathematical topics where I took like the psychology copywriting type topics more often. Um, and so I kind of picked up what I needed to from courses and books and data scientists at Shopify adopting me and teaching me after work how to do certain things. Um, and so I think I had to learn things in a very simplistic way. Um, I don't think I learned them in the formal theoretical way. I learned them very applicably. And so I think that maybe made it a little bit easier for me to explain it. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like when I'm writing an article, I always try to think of how I wish someone had explained it to me. And I think also a thing that I know is inaccessible to me as someone who doesn't have a formal background in math or data is a lot of the terminology mm. it trips me up when I'm reading a textbook or something. I'm like, I don't know that what this concept is because I didn't take this class in, you know, undergrad or something like that. And so um, I think I kind of know what to look for sometimes and what might trip people up. Um, but to your point, I'm often going through things multiple times and uh, my team or I are asking questions like, what is this? You know, even if we, if we, if we know, um, most people may not know, uh, especially given we're a technical team and most of growth is not a technical, is not considered a technical team. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you tricked people, uh, in the first round of like education. I'm curious, how did you trick people into getting educated and how do you continue to compel people when it may not be their day job that may, may not be in their job description? How do you bring people, um, to be interested in learning about experimentation and data? What are the internal marketing levers that you pull there? Yeah. So we used a lot of cats in our presentation and we put a lot of jokes <laughs> in there. So that was part of the trick. Um, but I, I was kind of alluding to the fact that we more or less signed people up to, t <laughs> to take the workshop. Um, we just went through team by team. We're like, content team, please come to our workshop and invited them all to the event. Um, but fortunately, I think once you have the, the buy-in from leadership, the experimentation culture just starts to come along. And I've always read that in, in blog articles. Um, I think I've written blog articles about how important the culture is, but it was really interesting to see it actually happen at Shopify of going from like, everything felt like um, an uphill battle and we were, you know, desperate for resources. And I was trying to like prove that CRO was important when I was doing uh, a more CRO role. And now, you know, there's an entire team that just does optimization. Um, and it hasn't been that long compared to how long I've been tr <laughs> been trying to do experimentation at Shopify. And so um, I think once that culture came along, it everything just felt easier. Um, and I Do was, you think that's a function of, of Morgan and other leaders coming in and like really having that understanding and evangelizing it from the top down in conjunction with the work that you'd been doing, you know, bottoms up and kind of educating other teams cross-functionally? Or how do you attribute like, I guess that growth of, of interest and culture of experimentation. I think so. Yeah. I think part of it was kind of like brute force coming through of like, this is important. We should try it. Um, I know Hannah Abaza early on was also like, we should try this at Shopify plus. And then, um, you know, it, it kind of took off a little bit, um, but definitely in terms of resourcing, it, it's leadership is who comes through. Uh, but I also think it's like, as you start launching experiments and as you start building a body of insights, um, you, I think what I saw happen was like, we became the insights people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people were like, what should we do now? Um, and it wasn't so much about the actual experiments that you had run uh, in their minds. It was what insights do you have? And I think that that was how I saw experimentation early on before uh, Morgan Brown and that leadership team came in, um, that was kind of first how I started seeing experimentation gain traction internally.
That's such a mature way to view experimentation. <clears throat> I was talking to Ben LeBay the other day. We did like a, a CRO meetup happy hour thing. And he puts out like all this great content on LinkedIn nowadays. One of his most recent ones was on the phases of an experimentation program and how it's often backwards. So it should start with like kind of learning how to experiment, like setting up guardrails, guidelines, best practices. So you actually know how to run a proper experiment. You've got the data in place. The second phase is basically being the customer insights team. So knowing more about the customer and the user than anyone else, um, teaching that and expanding the, the learning and insights to other teams. And then finally, once you've got those two out of the way, it's like, then you start to test a win. Then you start looking at win rates and like percentage wins and, and all of that stuff. But it seems like it's mostly backwards in most companies. And I'm not totally sure if this is a question or why that is, but it does seem like there's some misconception. And for some reason, y'all at Shopify have actually had a more mature understanding of, of the value of experimentation. Yeah, yeah. It's been really delightful um, regardless of who the leadership team has been. It's always seemed like there's been buy-in for the insights that come out of experimentation, um, which is great because I think that it, the, uh, the alternative is that people are very focused on the wins and we all know that most tests lose. Um, and most tests aren't designed in a way that you will learn something regardless of the outcome, which I think is also a, a common mistake. Um, but it's been really delightful getting to work in a company where people care about what we're learning and we're looking to build a body of insights and a body of knowledge, not just looking at the velocity and the win rate and going from each individual experiment. Yeah. So this is this is my new struggle is is trying to um, compute that and communicate that internally and also maybe starting to explore some of the industry wide stuff, too, because I think a lot of the conversation was around win rates and stuff like that in the past. But when you described it like that, how most tests fail, it's it's I don't think that's understood. I think a lot of programs have the expectation because of case studies out in the industry of like 300 percent wins and all this stuff that, you know, you really should be chasing those things. But you end up on a treadmill of disappointment if you're actually rigorous in your <laughs> experimentation or you start, you know, cherry picking and lying about results, which is obviously the, the worst case scenario. But in your case, it's like, instead of the treadmill of disappointment, you've got sort of a flywheel of learning, a flywheel of insights. And, and that flywheel kind of builds interest in the program, spits out wins here and there, and it grows over time in value, as opposed to the other one where it's, it's this constant drip, this constant expectation of like, all right, where's the next win? Where are we going to get it from? And it's like expecting kind of magic bullets. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think to your point, it definitely uh, creates a culture for where those oversights can can happen. You know, I would be suspicious if a win rate was too high. I'm like, are we, you know, choosing the metric after the experiment is concluded because we uh, like that's what we want on and we want this to look good. Um, yeah. So I think that if you are prioritizing the the win side of things it's going to incentivize bad behavior for lack of a better <laughs> expression yeah um switching it up so in the past you called yourself a jill of all trades mm -hmm. i think this is maybe a controversial opinion but i don't think that experimentation or cro are a specialty in the sense that most people talk about specialties in fact i actually think that most of our industry and in marketing really abuses the term special specialist versus generalist mm -hmm. but i'm curious about how you view yourself now because it, it seems like you've really dug down that tunnel of experimentation and conversion rate optimization so do you still look at yourself as a generalist a jill of all trades do you look at yourself as a specialist do you think cro is a specialty or is it um a, a, a combination of like six different specialties and you could go down each of those paths, like copywriting, design, statistics, et cetera. There's like six questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. I think I, to answer the one of them, I think that CRO is not a specialty. I think it's a nice label for a bunch of disciplines that are related to one another. Um, and like, for example, we were both writing about CRO for years and I feel like we covered drastically different topics. Um, and I still consider myself a generalist um, because I, you know, I've been down the CRO experimentation path for maybe four or five years now. No, just kidding. Five to six years. I'm, what is time? Um, <laughs> but like before that, I 
think that I would have identified more closely with content. And then before that, I would have identified more closely with affiliate marketing. Um, I think what I like about marketing is that there are so many different things you can learn. And I feel like it makes me better at each area that I kind of venture down for a while that I have an understanding of many of the other areas, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So we're on the same page, but the industry seems to glorify specialists. I think that, uh, I think it's a Nazim Taleb quote. I can't remember if it was him or not, but specialization is for ants. And uh, <laughs> humans are not meant to go down these narrow pathways. But I can also see this opposing argument, which is, um, you know, being a specialist, especially if you're um, trying to grow your career, personal brand, or um, if in any sense you're doing like content promotion or social media stuff, like being known for something very specific helps. So I could make the argument maybe that I've I've made some sacrifices by not specializing. Because I've, I've, I mean, literally right now, I, I run an experimentation program and I also run a content marketing agency. So how do I reconcile those two when I'm talking on social media or my email list? It's like, you know, I can't seem to close one of the doors because I like the other one so much. So do you feel like you've sacrificed anything by maintaining that um, um, generalism? Do you, do you sometimes wish that you had specialized in one of these areas or how do you feel about that? I think that people chose a specialization for me. <laughs> which is interesting. Like I, I think, um, I think people really, people in the industry really latched on to what I did at CXL. Um, often when I'm like, Oh, I'm at Shopify now. They're like, Oh, how's that going? I'm like, great. It's been four years. Um, and, <laughs> and I still think that in the marketing industry, I am most closely associated with the work that I did at CXL. Um, and so I often think, that I'm closely associated with content and CRO or maybe more so CRO um, despite the fact that I did that professionally for maybe a year and a half mm. at, at Shopify before I switched to like the, the foundational work with experimentation, um, which I think is much different than, than CRO or at least the way that it's set up in Shopify. It's much different. Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that people still to this day like look back on your work at CXL and that's kind of how they define you. Because that's it's been the same for me. I actually I was playing this game with a friend the other day called uh, First, Last, Best, Worst. Have you heard of this? Is this ringing any bells? So I'm reading this book called Storyworthy. It's all about kind of like how to tell and how to craft stories from a personal perspective, not necessarily from writing or like, you know, movie production or something like that. It's more so if we were just talking in a bar or something like that. Mm -hmm. So one of the first part of the book is all about like, it's saying like you have way more stories in your life than you actually know. And it's kind of giving you methodologies for finding those stories. And one of those is basically you take a bunch of categories and you say your first, last, best, and worst of those. And we were talking about jobs and, um, I, I had to say, like, I, I love what I'm doing now. HubSpot was amazing. Uh, the agency's great. But I actually said the best job was CXL simply because it formed the basis for so much of my career and personal brand and gave me so much leverage in those areas. Because people still to this day, when I'm on sales calls for the agency, people are like, yeah, man, I followed your work at CXL. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> do you, I mean, you, it sounds like you've got something similar. Do you miss that? Or like, do you think that is that something you chase or try to replicate? Like, that next experience that has that foundational, that, that high degree of leverage, like the CXL time did? I think so. Yeah. Like I, you know, the only reason I stopped working at CXL was because I didn't want to work from home anymore. Uh, or I didn't want to be like a remote employee in a non remote company. Um, otherwise I think that I likely would still be there. I loved working there. Um, and I think that much like you, I think about it as the highest growth period of my career. Um, and I definitely want to replicate those types of opportunities. Um, but it's interesting to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, like, how do you, I guess, I guess when I, when I reached out about working at CXL, I did kind of, uh, suspect that it could be a big opportunity like I wanted specifically to work with PEP I specifically wanted to work with CXL um, but I'm not sure that I've ever come across another opportunity that I've been like as sure of from the very beginning of like this will be something 
something big. But weirdly, when I was in it and we were, you know, we were like sending each other blog posts at 8 a.m. because we had just finished and we needed someone to edit it um, and it was going live in an hour. Um, it didn't feel like something monumental was happening to me. Mm-hmm. But looking back, you know, five years later, it definitely was a, a huge, impactful part of my life. It is interesting how, yeah, I totally agree. It felt mundane at the time, but in (laughs) retrospect, it's like, wow, like the connections we made at conferences and through our blog posts and all that stuff, it really did make a lasting impact. And I wonder too, if like that mundanity, is that a word? Uh, That mundane nature could also be playing out right now. And in five years, we look back and we actually say the same thing about the experiences we're going through. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because I think that when I was younger, I thought that everything was going to feel like a moment, yeah, you know, and that everything was going to feel more polished. And I'd be like, yes, I know what I'm doing. But like all of the, all of the industry connections that I made at CXL were like people I was hanging out with at the bar after the conference, like nothing ever felt like uh, a moment when I was in the moment. And that had, now looking back and I'm like, wow, this, that was the moment. And it, it led to all of these other good things, which I think is something I've thought about a lot lately of I thought it was supposed to feel a lot more polished and purposeful than anything has really felt (laughs) have you so this this idea of like experience them or contextualizing the moment as you're experiencing it um I think it was Virginia Woolf that had this paragraph or this exercise called moments of being in which she actually does embody like this um awareness of what she's going through and she knows that with a, a assuredness that in the future, this is going to be something that does change her life. Or like she does look back on, it sounds like you don't, or you didn't experience that at CXL, but maybe it has happened to you before. Do you, um, you know, do you find those moments in, in your daily life now? Like, do you find yourself thinking like, all right, this, this is going to be one of those moments and like in your career, um, can you identify some of those like in the, in the past, you know, year or two um, that you're like, all right, this is, this is something here. I honestly don't think I can. Uh, I feel like I feel like a lot of the times my internal experience is like I'm just winging it and I'm out here doing my best, and then <laughs> we'll do like an impact review six months later. I'm like, wow, look at all those great things that felt like just winging it. And um, I don't know if it's like internal self deprecation or or what, but um, it definitely to me feels like. I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And then I think it's like uh, in reflection is when I realize, no, this was, it, it was a, a journey. It just didn't feel like a linear journey at the time. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's the same. I can feel it sometimes and sometimes I'm wrong on this, but when I make big decisions, like when I quit HubSpot to go work for a startup or when I quit mm-hmm. CXL to work for HubSpot, um, the, the most recent time I felt this, that I, I knew in the future that I would look back on this moment as something profound was when I did mushrooms, but that's completely unrelated <laughs> to business stuff, but it's like very few and far between, like maybe, you know, I'm speaking at a big conference. Like I can sometimes look at that as a moment that's going to change me, but it's usually, it's usually the much more subtle things that end up producing big career wins and big career changes. And I think those are incredibly hard to identify. Um, I wanted to just bring it back a little bit. So we were talking about generalism versus, um, you know, specializing and you're working um, deeply in experimentation. Now I still look at you as one of the best writers I know um, in terms of like quality and like your writing chops. Do you, um, do you still keep that sword sharp? Do you, you know, do you do any freelance writing or like what's, what's the current state of, um, of writing in, in Chanel's world? Um, I did do freelance writing a few times, uh, and I, I kind of, I burnt myself out on it a little bit Mm. and it was because I didn't really plan going into it. I'm like, Oh, I will take on this one client. And then I didn't, I got excited about all the opportunities. And before you know it, I had eight and I'm like, I can't do this. Why did I do this? Um, (laughs) and so I think because I went into freelance writings more than once, uh, without preparing or without purpose just kind of thinking it would be a a side hobby Um, I got a little burnt out on it for a couple of years um, but it's definitely something I'm interested in doing again soon Uh, I just I I would want to make sure that I did it with 
purpose this time around than I had a plan. So I didn't look up <laughs> in six months and be like, ah, how did all these people get here? Yeah. I mean, the burnout thing is real and I, I often overbook myself, but I'm particularly scared about burning myself out with something like writing because it's given me so much like enrichment in other areas. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I look into. Um, do you keep a, a writing practice that's non monetary, non freelance oriented? Like, do you do any like journaling exercises or, or writing on a personal blog or anything like that? Yeah, I journal pretty regularly, which is kind of a new thing that I've been doing and I've been using it for self-reflection because I did realize that uh, so much of my realizations come in reflection. I'm like, oh, maybe I should reflect more than once every six months. Um, so I've been doing that in an attempt to kind of realize those moments as they're happening, or at least not so far after or not so long after they've happened. Um, and I also write poetry that I don't publish anywhere. I'm trying very hard to maintain hobbies that are not monetized, which is <laughs> very difficult for me because I just, I can't stop thinking like I could be making money. Like people do this and they get money for it. Why would I not be doing that? Um, but also then all of my hobbies start to look like my work and then I get burnt out. And so I, I write music and I write uh, poetry in my spare time. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into some of this because I love this concept. I am such a type A, like a uh, Enneagram three personality where I try to monetize all of my hobbies. So I've developed, uh, I, I call it non teleological hobbies. So it's like without aim, right? Like without mm -hmm. any like end result. So I loved learning Spanish. I didn't really have any goals with it. I wasn't going to make more money on it. Music has been the ultimate one. And I've recently got back into it over the pandemic, which has actually been a really nice silver lining. Um, but I go to the extent with this stuff because I, I do wrap myself up in my work too much where I have to come up with just novel, extremely, extremely novel hobbies where it's like, there's no possible way you could actually look at this as pragmatic. Like I've been getting into magic tricks recently. <laughs> so I go on YouTube okay. and I learn how to, I learn how to uh, do magic tricks. So it sounds like music is that for you. It sounds like poetry is that for you. Have you developed any other weird ones where it's like, all right, there's not there's not a way that I can monetize this. Like, do you go kayaking? Like, do, what's what's the outside life outside of work? I play a lot of video games. I'm going to be honest with you. I read a lot. I play a lot of video games. And I also accidentally got super into tarot and astrology. Oh, in, no way. <laughs> like Christmas of 2019. I was so bored. I was sitting at my parents' house and I just went through so much documentation on how to like, read a birth chart and like all of the planets and the houses that they're in and it's just like accidentally become a part of my personality that I did not foresee or <laughs> intend to happen um so it's how did you even weird. how did you even get into that well because I always knew that I was an Aries which I I like people have told me they're like that's what this means and like that doesn't sound like me like they're angry and like super impatient and like very uh high strung and I think despite my type a tendencies I'm a fairly laid back person um and I'm like that doesn't sound like me and so I kind of just like went into it being like why does everyone <laughs> why do so many people think this is a a thing when um I feel like it's so obviously wrong and then I learned about all the different placements and what they're supposed to mean um but in actuality I use that also kind of like as a re reflection tool of like what of this do uh I see in myself and what do I not and I I think it's good for introspection um much like much like tarot do you use poetry as a reflection tool as well or what's the utility of that for you yeah I think so I generally we'll get like a, a feeling of some sort and then I will start with a line and then I'll build uh, the entire poem around the line and then usually I will take the poetry and put that over music because I cannot I don't I cannot write songs any like I can't sit down and compose and then also write lyrics over top of it it just does not make sense in that order for my brain for some reason I have so to you do lyrics early. first and then music yeah I'm totally the, the opposite. I, I'm trying to write music again. It's been years since I've tried it, but 
I, um, sorry, there's another framework that I got to bring up. It's uh, plotters versus pantsers. So my friend is a writer and she's talking about how there's kind of like gardeners and architects, people who plan out the entire book from start to finish and the people who basically start writing and figure it out as they go. And I've tried to do it in layers or strategies, like outline a song, think about like the theme, uh, the key that it's in, all of this stuff, like, you know, melody. But w- when it comes down to it, I have to just kind of like sit down, come up with a cool riff and <laughs> basically just sing some like, you know, generic, uh, like gobbledygook over it, like just like nonsense. Mm -hmm. And then once I have that, then I sit down and actually write the lyrics and make them make sense. But it sounds like yours is is somewhat backwards to that. Yeah. And I think based on the YouTube videos I've watched about like how to uh, compose music, because I don't know how, I think my cousin taught me how to play guitar when I was a kid, but I don't like haven't, I've never taken a class or anything. So it was like, watching YouTube videos to figure out how to write music and all of them describe your method. And I was mm. like, I, I can't do that. I'm trying so hard. I also play bass and that's all I have right now, which I find very hard to write music on. So I think it, it helps to have the lyrics first for that reason as well. Yeah. Well, you've got to take, um, take the path of, of less friction. I feel like there's a lot <laughs> of like shoulds in terms of like, you know, here's how you should come up with an A-B test idea. Here's how you should outline your your article for SEO. Here's how you should write a song. But it's like, oftentimes those ideas, those methods don't work for me. So like trying to fit my square peg into the round hole of like the industry shoulds is like just not effective. And especially right. true with creative stuff. It's like, if you're going to do this for enjoyment, like there's no reason you should actually just like <laughs> force yourself to do things because other people do it this way. Right, exactly. Like I'm, I'm not going to you know, cut an album or <laughs> anything anytime soon. Um, so I figure you might as well just do it in the way that feels good to you. So an interesting thing, one thing that I'm noting is like, you've got a pretty good yin and yang here. Like you think a lot about reflection and also drive. So like, it seems like you're pretty well balanced there. Um, and then also like your reflection oriented activities are all somewhat creative in nature. So that may actually, do you think that actually does factor into some of your work, like indirectly speaking? It's, it's sort of a reflection period that gives you the mental rest that allows for your creativity to flourish when it does come down to, uh, you know, to driving and working in like the actual, uh, the yang side, the, the work side of your life. Yeah, I think so. And it's also interesting when they kind of interact. Like I remember um, Jason Naidu was the director of growth at Shopify for a while. And I published an article at CXL while I was at Shopify and he joked that I was giving away all of our secrets because it was about SaaS retention optimization. And I was like, no, no, like I just learned all those things as I was writing the article. Like they were things that were happening and my brain knew, but they were all separate and writing the article kind of brought them together um, in a cohesive way that was easy for me to then like turn around and tell people as a process, if that makes sense. And so I think it's interesting when the creative parts like writing uh, mix with the professional parts. So that, that is super interesting. And that's, that's kind of what I was going to, um, go into with, with regards to the writing stuff and keeping the sword sharp. I use writing. I mean, by and large nowadays, the writing that I actually do myself, um, not through like agency and clients and freelancers and all that stuff. I use it as a thinking tool and oftentimes to communicate ideas to other people. Like I've got this idea in my head right now and I started writing the article on the concept of decentralized content marketing. So typically you're going to go through a process like a centralized content team. Uh, You're going to work with SEO to establish keywords. There's going to be strict brand guidelines and an editorial calendar. And then you'll probably promote it through like company channels. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing more now and now like this idea of smaller teams who need to be agile and cover more ground of establishing some general company principles, but then letting people pull from a pool of ideas and build up their own followings. And then sometimes there's audience crossover, sometimes there's not. So I I just had this word in my head, decentralized content marketing. But then when I started writing the article, it became clearer and clearer to me how this actually looks in the real world and what are the limitations and who's it for. And it basically crystallized this whole idea for me. It's not done yet, but I, I think that's a really big tool for writing for me. And oftentimes when I'm trying to communicate ideas to the team at, at Workado, I'll write like what is essentially an article before I ever, you know, set up the meeting or communicate because I need to clarify it to myself. So do you, do you still do this like internally? Do you still, I mean, write like 
it's not a blog post, but <laughs> do you still do like a memo <laughs> or something like that? And, um, you know, if, if it's not as a big a part of your life now, like, do you kind of miss that in terms of like that, that modality you had for crystallizing ideas, like the SAS retention example you gave? Yeah, I still do it to an extent, uh, just for myself personally, I write a lot in notebooks. Um, I joke frequently that I am better in writing than in person. Um, <laughs> and I definitely feel like, you know, in, in a meeting, uh, if people are asking for concepts or ideas or suggestions, um, it's much more likely that my best thought is going to come after when I can write it down um, mm. and think through all the thoughts I had in the meeting. And so if I'm going into a big meeting um, or I'm trying to present a concept to people, I will typically, whether or not I present the deck or present the doc, I will have written it out beforehand so that I know my thinking around it. Um, but I do miss, this is like not quite as related, but I do miss writing. I think I've gotten a little bit busier um, and also content is not my main role anymore. And so it's easier for me to do podcasts and to do speaking gigs to kind of get my thoughts and ideas and maintain a personal brand than it is to write. And I definitely miss writing because I think a, I'm just objectively better at it. than I am speaking. Um, but also B I think that it is more crystallizing, I think is a, is a good word that you used, I think um, is easier for me to crystallize my thoughts than when speaking conversationally about something. Did you, when you were at CXL or when you were freelancing, did you still look at writing on a certain level as a process of crystallizing your ideas or ex exploring ideas or was it more functional? I think I did at CXL. And then I think um, eventually I reached a point where the topics that people wanted to cover were for SEO. And I'm like, I, I wrote a very similar article. I still feel like it was the best way that I could have written the article. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to write it better. Um, and so I feel like I kind of also got burnt out in that sense of like, I don't know how to write a better article on this keyword. And I was kind of con competing against myself <laughs> on, on keywords. Um, but I, at CXL, I did feel like it was like an exploratory um, digging into something, doing research, talking to industry experts, getting their feedback, thinking about how that mixed with the research that I had done, what my own thoughts were, what Pep's thoughts were, what your thoughts were, and kind of like, it, it felt like often that I ended up with a paper more than mm -hmm. a blog article. Yeah, it's interesting. A couple notes there. So I've got this kind of... Um uh duality going on right now where it's like business wise like seo is a great channel uh for content it's super predictable it's it's how many companies can win but i do think at a certain level seo degrades the soul of a writer and i've tr certainly felt that like now that i'm looking at keywords all the time sometimes i even look at my own content and instead of just writing the damn piece in the way that i want to i'm like well how do i actually attach a keyword to this and like put it through clear scope and blah blah blah, blah. and it kind of ruins it a little bit um in my head but you and I, I feel like maybe towards the end, we looked at keywords a little bit, but through our time at CXL, I don't recall really placing a high emphasis on SEO. No, I don't. I would agree with you. I think, you know, a lot of the times we were talking over like coffee or beer and you're like, oh, I read this book. And so I'm going to write, like it inspired me to write this piece. And then I do think we weren't like, I don't think we were negligent. We did like after the fact, maybe look and see, you know, okay, what keywords can I, you know, position myself well for, but it wasn't the heart of the article. It didn't drive think. the content strategy. I think right. we can certainly say that. So I'm trying to do a, a retrospective here. What did drive the content strategy? Like, how did we come up with ideas? You know, and like, once we had those ideas, how did we push those into action? I loved your uh, explanation of your process of going through that. Um, but like, where did you get, where did you get content ideas? I got them from what I was learning. I often, I often felt like I was learning something and then the next week I would write an article on it. Um, and I, I think a couple of times since working at CXL, people have come to me and said, uh, so like, so great that like, you had all of this knowledge that you were sharing with us. I was like, no, no, I just got that. And then I wrote about it in the way that I wished that, 
like was accessible to me instead of going to all of these different places and all of these different sources and, you know, doing the reflection on what I'm learning and putting it in a, a good format or an accessible format. Um, that's what I tried to do. Um, and I think the only like tripwire I had was I told you and Pep what kind of topics I was thinking of. And I think maybe he vetoed a couple. Um, but other than that, it was kind of just what I was learning and what I was interested in. So this is super interesting. Just trying to reverse engineer this here because CXL's content strategy was effective in many ways um, that you can decouple from SEO because it kind of did uh, buck that trend that uh, there's an animals blog post of your blog should be a library, not a publication. But I think in many ways, CXL did succeed in building a publication. And I think that was because of, not in spite of our lack of SEO uh, insistence. So what you said was sort of like... um, like my friend was talking the other day about career advice and she says like this this idea of um you know follow your passion is bullshit what you should actually do is follow your curiosity and i actually i thought about that longer and i think that's really that's cool cuz what what we did i think was totally follow our curiosity like i started reading books on you know i read all of nasim taleb's books and those give me a million ideas i read um thinking fast and slow and that gave me a million more ideas and then you know just blog posts and community threads and and whatever else and then it was sort of like a tributary, like each, like the river would kind of splinter off. And like, I would talk to Matt Gershoff about something on like statistics and he would mention, oh yeah, there's also this idea that like, you know, in the 1920s was a very popular methodology. And I'll be like, well, shit, I kind of want to learn about that now. <laughs> and like, it was this really cool path where I think our incentives at the company were aligned with our natural curiosities. And I guess like, I'm trying to weave this into a retrospective narrative which is like management wise, it seems like Pep accidentally was very effective or maybe not accidentally, <laughs> but he kind of let us just learn what we wanted to learn and get paid to do so by writing about it. <laughs> does that, does that resonate with you? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Especially when you were talking about, um, you know, you'd then take something and discuss it with Matt. Um, and then you would find seven other things you wanted to explore. I felt very similarly of, like I would take something to Talia Wolf or Joe from Copy Hackers and they would be like, oh yeah, this is similar to this. And then I would go down that rabbit hole or like one of my favorite articles I wrote to this day is the one when I learned about um, buyer modalities. And then I like dug into that and realized it was just based on Myers-Briggs. And then I was like talking to Pep and he was like, Myers-Briggs is totally made up. And then I did like research on that. And then I wrote this entire article just like tearing apart the buyer modalities because Myers-Briggs was made up um, and it made like a lot of people angry. I was going to say, I remember that one being (laughs) controversial. (laughs) Yeah. And I still can't believe he just like let me spend so much time researching this and then publishing it when, you know, lots of people have given talks and stuff on, on the buyer modalities and written books on them. And I feel like he definitely let us follow our curiosity and kind of figure out for better or worse uh, (laughs) where that led us. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because like looping back to the first question I asked you, which was like, what do you miss about CXL? Now, I think if I asked myself that, it would be that just kind of like winding path of following your curiosity, which I've gotten in moments at different companies that I've worked for, but never fully because, I mean, you're incentivized. I'm like, not not necessarily short-term goals, but you do have metrics that you've got to hit. You've got to like basically focus your energies and like there's a little less of this like dilettante exploration um, and I actually feel like I'm, I'm recapturing some of this through the work of the agency. So li- literally what I'm doing right now is I'm asking you all of the questions that I am naturally curious about <laughs> and I'm, you know, kind of getting paid to do it in a way like this is indirect because eventually some people may, you know, listen to the podcast and respect me as an expert and hire me. But it's like, I think that's something that, you know, if I could design my ideal life, I would carve out more time for is just naturally following that path of curiosity. Right. Yeah. Which I think is like the uh the concept of I have two thoughts. I think is also the concept of being bored is I think is like deeply rooted in this idea of like when you are just free to do whatever you want and you have no constraints and you're just like following your interests um, or you're following what is stimulating you right now, you end up in points of genius. Um, and I also think like what initially drew me to Shopify was that like, wide open space 
Um, mm. It's a big, bigger company now than when I started. But when I started, it was the biggest company I had ever worked for. Um, and I was excited that they didn't prescribe what you should be doing. Like I remember my first two weeks of working there, I kept going to my lead being like, what am I supposed to be doing? And he was like, just meet people and like figure out what you're interested in. And you can do that. I'm like, but what do you mean? Like what article is due? And he's like, no articles are due. (laughs) Um, So I think a lot of that energy, despite all of the growth at Shopify is still, is still alive. And I think that's very exciting. I think that the, you know, the short-term goals and like, being in the like more leadership positions are challenging me in an interesting way. But I also love that that um, space is still available at such a large company. It's going to be hard for the company to maintain that. I hope they do. Um, I know that's something that with increasing size and scope and specialization, like that does become very difficult to let people just like have a playground, but I love that. And I I resonate with my early, it resonates with my early experience at HubSpot as well. Um, the leadership stuff though is interesting because I think though it may be a little more constrained, like I know you're dealing with this and I'm also dealing with this. It feels mundane right now, but I actually think this may be something we look back on in a couple of years and say like, wow, that, that actually was one of those, you know, CXL moments that we didn't think was like changing the career trajectory. But in retrospect, I actually did learn a ton and those constraints forced me in this direction that, you know, resulted in this career change. Yeah, I totally agree. I, um, When I joined Shopify, I joined Shopify because I wanted, I had got a beer with Cassandra Campbell, um, who's currently the senior experimentation and analysis lead. Um, And at the time she ran the content marketing team at Shopify. And so I grabbed a beer with her and I decided that I wanted to work for her. And that's why I joined Shopify. Um, And I think what is so interesting about kind of following a person is that you get to like keep those spaces open, right? Like if you, if you find people who appreciate that space and want to create it for you, then they can help you keep them open and they can help keep that curiosity open. Um, But also it's been interesting on the leadership side of um, I was kind of resistant for a while about being a people lead. Um, I didn't know if I wanted to do it. I had tried it at previous companies. I was like a air quotes director of marketing. It was a very small company, a very inflated title. Um, but I did manage a few people and I didn't enjoy it. And so I was very nervous about doing it at Shopify and Cassandra really encouraged me to try it. And I ended up loving it. And it feels like a completely different set of challenges. And it feels like a shift from where I've spent the vast majority of my career um, in a way that I maybe wasn't really expecting. I didn't think it was going to change that much, Um, but I'm excited about it. And I think that you're right. It probably is the closest I felt to feeling like this is one of those moments of, of great change. So with that note, can I ask a couple more like broad career goal questions? Yeah. So you said on a different podcast that I listened to, <clears throat> during my uh, extensive research phase <laughs> for this podcast, <laughs> initially you wanted to be a CMO and that goal has changed for you. Yes, definitely. So it's f- a funny story before I ask the question, but I, when I got beers with you know Pep and Ben and the CRO meetup the other day, Pep told me that I once told him the same thing, <laughs> like that apparently <laughs> I also had the same goal and I also no longer want that. So it's kind of fast. I, I don't even remember saying that, but apparently I also used to want to be a CMO. Um, so why do you think you initially wanted to be a CMO and why do you think that goal changed and what do you want to do now? I actually thought about this the other day because like a really old inconsequential account that I had, one of the secret questions was, what do you want to, what was your dream job as a kid? And my answer was CMO. And I was like, what? Like, why, when did I ever have this dream? Um, I think like when I was thinking about my big life goals, I was like, 14, 15, when I started getting into marketing um, in like a, in like a meaningful way and not just reading about it anymore. And I think that my teenage brain just thought uh, marketing meets you're really, really good at it. And you're like, like what's the top level I can essentially reach here. Yeah. Right. Like I think it was just marketing plus ambition. Um, And also in working at smaller companies, uh, 
lack of understanding of what a CMO would be at a like sizable company. And now, you know, working at Shopify, even Shopify four years ago, if I'm thinking, I wouldn't have wanted to be the CMO of, of that size company either. Um, <laughs> it just is, it's a very different role. And I love, I love the leadership aspect of it. I love the strategy aspect of it, but I also love the craft and I love implementation and I would never want to go beyond the point where I'm like com- completely not shipping anymore. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's something that, I mean, for me, and it sounds like for you, when you think about this, it's, it's not completely tangible, like how you can describe like why you don't want it. But I, I did this exercise where I thought like, all right, five years from now, I'm, I'm a VP marketing CMO, whatever, like how much happier am I? And then I thought about like a contrary path, which is like if I'm a founder or something like that, um, you know, how happy am I? And just like based on the pure emotional like feeling, I just like, you know, analyzed how my body felt, how my emotions felt in that moment. It was immediately clear to me that the CMO thing was not what I wanted to do. It's like, yeah, maybe like it would be marginally more interesting than what I'm doing now. Maybe not. Who knows? But when I thought about the founder path, I'm like, oh, that makes my eyes light up. That's crazy. Like, I just feel like so much more excitement when I think about it like that. Um, so I guess like, do you have, like, what are your, do you have any big milestones or like where, where you're kind of heading now? Or like, do you have any ideas of that? Like, what, what would that be for you that, that, you know, founder path for me essentially? Yeah, I think, um, probably fairly similar to what you're thinking. Like I love what I'm doing at Shopify would like to continue uh, kind of improving at the things that I'm doing there and learning there and continue like refining my craft, which I think is a big part of it. Like I really love education um, <laughs> despite not really pursuing it in a formal way. And so I think I realized that I want to make a lot of space for continuing to learn and grow. So I take a lot of courses still. I'm in the middle of a front end development course. So I'm trying <laughs> trying to learn how to code. Damn. I'm also taking like stats courses. I read a lot of textbooks. Like those are the things that make me uh, really happy. And then I do eventually want to start a business. Um, I don't know what kind of business, uh, but I, I still think that it's kind of like a similar model to what you have of like a, a side gig um, or not a side gig, but on top of a, uh, a day job, more or less. Um, probably, so, if and you, I also would like to write a book. <laughs> I was just going to ask that. That's amazing. I, I literally wrote this down as a note. I said I could see you writing a book one day. Have you thought about that? So it sounds like you've thought about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I would love to write a book, um, nonfiction, uh, but I don't have a great idea yet, and so I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> that's definitely in in my pipeline as well we're thinking about one for the agency but still it's in the amorphous um, nebulous stage right now so it sounds like if you had 100 million plus dollars what you would do is you would read a shitload write a shitload and tinker on some business projects is that about right <laughs> basically yeah yeah that's essentially what i would do too because I've, I've had this exercise i've thought about this so much like all right if money wasn't an issue like completely devoid of the uh, imperative to work what would i do it's like probably just you know code tinker learn some new skills like definitely read and write quite a bit more than i do now probably more books but yeah it'd be really interesting and like i feel like the business ideas that i would come up with there would be less practical uh so to Mm -hmm. speak like it probably wouldn't be like an agency or a software company it would Mm -hmm. probably be like something i'm super interested in like uh like experiential stuff like i love retreats like ice baths saunas like you know how could i build a business like that i I don't even know what the answer would be but it's it's kind of an interesting thought exercise yeah you would be fantastic at that i feel like you (laughs) i feel like you excelled in your uh cxl live like host vp party socializing yeah (laughs) that's what uh, pep would always say for this is management advice for anyone listening uh if you can't pay them more make them feel important it was a direct quote from Pep, and he called me the VP of pre-party and made me just organize the event, essentially. <laughs> Those are fun days. So do you have, is there somebody you're chasing? Like, do you look ahead and think like, I want to, you know, model myself after that person? I don't think so, which is kind of an interesting question. I don't, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but like maybe 
seven, 10 years ago, I was thinking of like people like Talia Wolf, Joe from Copy Hackers, uh, Pep even. Um, but I think not so much. I think the older that I'm getting, the more I'm realizing that like, while I do love what I do, um, I'm a lot more interested in terms of like progression in the things outside of work. Like I'm really happy with where I'm at with work and career. Um, and I'm kind of at a point where I'm looking at what is the, what is developing the rest of my life look like? And so it's harder to, it's harder to get people's point of view on that from like Twitter. So I don't know exactly how to emulate or, or who I would look up to in that regard. Yeah, no, this is a very frustrating uh, transition I'm going through as well. You can't read as many blog posts on it. It's it's much more <laughs> soft and squishy, which I love that word too, squishy. Um, yeah. So do you mind if I ask a couple of rapid fire questions? No. So I guess this is related, but um, a little bit more concrete and less grandiose, but who do you admire professionally and why? Uh, okay, can I answer two people? Yeah, for sure. That break the rapid fire rules. Okay. Um, I would say Cassandra Campbell, who is currently my lead at Shopify. Uh, We've worked together for a number of years. And I think that she's really embodied what I love about like being a great leader, but then also having like this deep technical ability and really like honing your craft continuously. Um, So definitely look up to her. And then I would say um, Jonathan Volk is still a mentor and like personal hero of mine. He was, uh, when I was 15, we met on a forum about massive multiplayer online chatting communities. And he kind of gave me my first opportunity to really learn about marketing. And he ended up being one of my references when I applied at Shopify and is still, uh, he's running like an e-commerce business now, but He's still someone I feel really shaped how I look at career and life. And I still really look up to him. That's awesome. If you could create your own category in Jeopardy, what would it be? And would you get every question right? It would definitely be reality TV. um, And I would definitely get every question right. (laughs) What kind of reality TV do you like? Uh, I like all reality TV. I love all of the Real Housewives. I watch Survivor. I watch Big Brother. Uh, I watch all the TLC shows, Vanderpump Rules, 90 Day Fiance. I watch way too much TV. I should have put oh that my in my God. hobbies category. Sorry. This is amazing. <laughs> this, I never knew, knew this about you. <laughs> it's bad. The worse the show, the more I like it. Oh, I love F-Boy that. F-Boy Island. Have you seen that? It's so no. bad. <laughs> is this on Netflix? Uh, I think it's on HBO. All right. I've got to dip my toes into this. F- F-Boy Nation? Like, fuck boy Nation? Yeah, I think that maybe they didn't know what network was going to pick it up, so they went with F Boy instead. Yeah, right. <laughs> but like, I get the concept. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, all right, so here's a question just for you: Which uh, do you have a favorite punk rock or emo song? Um, I think, despite the fact that I think the the band is a little problematic, I think I have to go with uh, "I Believe You," but my Tommy Gun doesn't buy brand new because I have uh, it part of the lyrics tattooed on my body. So I feel like I have to say that one. What uh, what happened with brand new? Uh, they have some sexual assault allegations against them. Oh shit. I didn't even know yeah. that. I, I used <laughs> so to love brand new back in the day. I'm like, ugh. <laughs> You're like, no, this is a tattoo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my God. But I mean, some of those lyrics are just, you, you can't get them out of your head. It's so, and anytime I meet someone who is like very into emo and punk, actually Joe Martin, uh, oh, yeah. hanging out one time, I was like, he was like, I don't see a band tattoo. And then I explained the tattoo to him. He was like, that's genius. It's so good. That's awesome. <laughs> Only people from. Did you know I, I met Joe through basically punk rock and emo? Like we met at Warp Tour when he was managing a band in Chicago and he was like walking around handing out CDs wearing a banana costume. That's, I met him when I was like 14 or 15. I did not know that. Is that how he started going to CXL? Because I met him no, telling no. ghost stories at CXL. No. So I saw his name on the registrations and I was like, wait, I think I know this guy. And I looked it up and I was like, this is the same dude. What a small world. That's hilarious. Joe is one of my favorite people I've met just randomly. 
And we have stayed in touch for so many years just because we were mildly drunk and trading ghost stories at CXO. <laughs> <laughs> is fantastic. Um, I actually have a call with him today, oddly enough. Um, nice. I'll, I'll tell him you said hi. Thank you. Uh, which talent would you most like to have? Uh, I would love to be able to paint or draw or like be a tattoo artist would be very cool. Do you dabble? Do you uh, draw or do anything like that now? I can draw a cat on a raft is like my <laughs> go-to. I don't know why. I started drawing it in high school and it's the only thing I've ever learned how to draw. Yeah. So this is not a rapid fire question, but I have to ask. So I've always really admired like visual art. Like I kind of surround myself with it in my place. Like I always enjoyed going to museums when I would travel but I have like, I would say that's probably my least developed skill is visual artistry. Like I, I can't draw myself. I even like on the CRO side, like I don't know how to design shit that well. Like I can kind of look and see like what bad UX is and do the research to figure it out. But when it comes to like even wireframing, I really struggle with that stuff. Mm -hmm. So because you wish you had the skill, um, it sounds like you don't draw or paint or anything. Do you think that's actually increased your, um, admiration and respect for people who have that or like for visual art in general? Absolutely. I mean, I put like no effort into developing the skill whatsoever, but in my head, I'm just like, this is monumental. You must be so talented. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure that they are, but I think also like, I don't have that same feeling about like musicians or writers, but I do specifically for visual arts. And so I think it's just because I lack it so completely. <laughs> my, mine is, it's, it's so interesting. You said music. Cause I, I still admire musicians, but it's more like a craftsman and a virtuoso maybe, but with art, it's like magic. Like I can break down and understand even the most complex stuff, like maybe like a Radiohead song and think, oh, that's weird. You did that and really genius, but I get it. Whereas art, I'm like, I, no clue, no clue how you did that. Yeah, exactly. And then you talk to someone who is an, I have a lot of friends who are artists and they're like, you just start and then practice just like everything else that you've done in your life i'm like no no it's it's magic there's something that happens that i just don't have and you do and that's, that's the only truth i can accept <laughs> so uh brilliant segue into the next question here do you consider yourself more scientific or artistic i think i consider myself more artistic i think that all of the scientific things that i've learned in like mathematics has been uh forced and has not necessarily come naturally to me my like grade 10 math teacher told me that I should not take advanced functions in grade 11 <laughs> because I was going to it was going to bring down my average and so that I should stick to the arts so I think that that's probably my natural answer and I've forced myself to learn the other parts interesting if you could have dinner with one person dead or alive who would it be uh Charlotte Bronte is my favorite author. And so I would choose her. Okay. Yeah. What do you think, or what do you consider the most overrated virtue? Patience. <laughs> Interesting. Tell me more. Um, I'm not very patient. I guess that's maybe the only Aries quality that I identify with. Uh, <laughs> I think that there's something to be said about speed i mean there's like a million people who are gonna not a million people because no one cares but like people will come back and point to all the times that i've tweeted about the long game and uh you know being patient and making strategic decisions in your career but i also think that there needs to be balanced with like short-term speed if that makes sense at all it does entirely make sense i have struggled with patience forever even at hubspot like i would grind myself into circles like i would basically just like I would be way too impatient with myself. And then my manager would be like, dude, chill, like, calm down. Like, it's, we're all good. <laughs> you know? Like, cause I came come from startup backgrounds where it was like, you really do have to like, you know, pride yourself on speed. Otherwise the company dies. So now that I'm building my own company, uh, we all are pretty impatient, but um, we've decided that we're going to be impatient with effort and patient with results. So I think it's pretty much what you said there. It's like play the long game, but definitely don't give up speed in terms of like how you're getting shit done to get there. Right. I like that a lot. It's much more poetic than, than the way I put it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've really had to like apply this uh, as a therapeutic lens to our own, you know, shortcomings with impatience. So thought a lot about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Also like in just in all areas of my life, I'm like always thinking that I should be 
further along or like, why am I not here? Or like, you know, I'm just constantly racing against myself. And then when you kind of zoom out, you're like, oh, chill out. Like, yeah, I'm good. Doing this great. is fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's another benefit to the journaling and reflection, by the way. Like I find that when I do journal in the morning and do gratitude journals, I tend to be able to see that like a higher level view. But when I don't, I get caught in the weeds and I, I, yeah, feel like I'm constantly just like sprinting to, to race myself or something. Right. <laughs> right. Um, what's a career choice that you considered, but didn't pursue? Um, okay. Well, I have two, uh, for, I considered going to law school like right before I dropped out of university I had to do an analysis of like do I want to be a lawyer because if so I can't do this um and I decided not to go to law school because I didn't want to dress well um (laughs) which sounds like a joke but is genuinely the reason I like was sure I wasn't going to law school um (laughs) and then I think the second one that feels relevant is when I flew from the east coast of Canada to Toronto to get Uh, a drink with Cassandra, who I eventually started working for at Shopify. Um, I was actually in Toronto to interview at a different company. And they had like asked me to fly out and had uh, like set up this whole dinner and everything we were going to meet. And I ended up not choosing that and messaging Cassandra after being like, hey, is Shopify hiring? Um, So that feels like also more relevant maybe than my almost law school story. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's really interesting because a lot of people will answer this with the law school type thing. But yours is actually a very concrete, almost chose that path. The law school thing is also, I have a sneaking suspicion that anybody with a high degree of ambition who studied something in the um, you know humanities, so not necessarily engineering or mathematics, I have a suspicion that almost everybody with a degree of ambition in that area has thought about law school. I certainly did for a little bit. Yeah. It also helped having um, an aunt. My aunt went to law school because she liked all of the law TV shows uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when she was a kid. And she was like, do not go to law school. And now I have one of my best childhood friends also went to law school. And she's like, you should be so glad you didn't go to law school. Like they're all looking for uh, kind of what's next. We really glamorize it in in media and and a lot of like our folklore. I actually, I don't know if this is the reason I didn't pursue it. I think I had other converging factors in my life, such as the books I was reading and kind of ideas as to like what I could do. But I remember reading uh, an article from Tucker Max in the Huffington Post that said like why you shouldn't go to law school. And he laid out every single argument or like every single reason people have for going to law school and just debunked everything about it. And I was like, oh, fuck. All right. <laughs> like, this is, this is really, this is a good argument against it. So right. kind of fascinating. Uh, okay. One more easy one. What uh, like blogs, podcasts, influencers have you been following recently um, that you've been enjoying? I uh, wish that I could remember the URL. My friend Moj, um, who used to work at Shopify, and she's now uh, data at Wealth Simple, and she just launched a blog. And I cannot say enough good things about her. Maybe I can send you <laughs> the URL when I remember it after. Um, she like stayed after work and taught me uh, SQL and like taught me so many things and was a big pillar of the data science portion of experimentation at Shopify. And um, I just like truly think she's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And she just started a blog. And so I like instantly subscribed and I'm so excited because I feel like since she's left Shopify, it's been a void in both my heart and my brain uh, (laughs) that I'm hoping this blog will fill. Love it. Um, All right, cool. So is there anywhere some uh, people who want to find you online, anywhere you'd point them to? Probably Twitter. I tweet a lot of nonsense, um, but it's the, it's the place that I'm most active. So it's just Chanel underscore Mullen is my handle. I like it. I like nonsense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Chanel. This was super fun. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad we could catch up. 